as we've seen, archaeology in this day and age is not without its technological advances. Now, CNEA makes use of several different technologies, both in the field and here at home. And to tell us more about the use of technological toys in today's cyber archaeology practices is Dr. Kent Bramlett. <laughs> cyber archaeology is a lot of fun because we're early adopters of new technology. Many times we don't have a lot of uh, research funds to work with, but we're good borrowers. So we borrow from the um, you know, uh, oil industries looking for new um, underground resources. We borrow from the medical technology, which is really good at imaging, again, insides, things we can't access directly. And so we've come to call this cyber archaeology. It, it collects and gathers a lot of um, different approaches within its umbrella. We're looking here at what we call a cave. I'm sitting there in the with the controllers. Uh, this is actually down in uh, University of California, San Diego. And we have adapted the technology they developed there, thanks Tom Levy and Tom DeFonte and others, uh, uh, up here in La Sierra with a nine panel system. You can see here a sort of a diagram how we have to link these um, TVs together. It's 3D, so what I show you is going to be a sort of a poor 2D rendition. Um, but we split an image up, a 3D image up, and create then um, a visual effect that sort of pulls you into it. You have to wear 3D glasses, and we often get school groups and other uh, groups that come over to see what this is like. So take, for example, this footage from Luxor. Now we've put it in 2D for you, um, but it would be 3D if you were to come and visit. And it's moving, so you feel as it wraps around you. CAVE is an acronym for something like the CAVE, we wanted CAVE in the terminology, but CAVE um, virtual environment, okay? So this happens to be the temple at Luxor in Egypt, but we could develop footage from many different locations, and we have. Again, this is one way that we can present complex data to many people who might not sit down with one of those large publication volumes that, that Doug and Monique just showed you a few minutes ago. Ideally, everybody would sit down with that on their you know nightly reading, right, before going to sleep. They might go to sleep a little sooner. At any rate, this system um, can utilize 3D renditions such as at the Light Bronze Age Temple at Tel Alu Mary. Um, this won't be in motion, but we do have a uh, 3D sets from different locations within the structure. Now, our plans are to develop this further, and here's the four-room house from the, the early Iron Age stratum at Tel Alu Mary. Again, imagine being able to go into this system and using modern um, programming techniques, even Real Engine, from which is the back end for Fortnite. So gaming engines like that, you can take imagery like this, you can create walkthrough environments, and you could put scans like Don is doing here in the in the lab, and put those artifacts back in their find locations, and then you could point a uh, a laser pointer at it, and panels would pop up with more information about it. So this is one of the things that we're developing we hope to pursue in more, with more applications in the future. Another area which has become increasingly uh, important, both in the field and back um, at our research universities, is photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is simply taking many photos and creating a three, really a 3D model, so not 3D with glasses or something like that, but a 3D model that's movable and rotatable. So for example, this is the uh, house um, that we're excavating at Balua. And you, you can move around in it and look at different rooms from different angles, going up to the main doorway here. You're looking through the doorway, floating over and, and looking at the courtyard and the blocked up doorways that we hope to excavate this coming summer. So this pre uh, allows an interface with someone who may be a researcher or simply a consumer of the information that we're reconstructing about the past. How do we get that? Well, it comes from um, quite a bit of work in the field and then post-processing. So take, this looks like an aerial uh, photograph, but really it's a composite of some 250 pictures. You can see each blue panel here 
is what we would call a, a camera or a individual photo. For this, at the end of the season, I walked around and I took all of these pictures, first around the perimeter, then trying to catch every room, um, more or less every face of every room straight on, and then down in it, angling up at the doorways and the lintels. And, and then after that, special software, we use uh, Metascape by Agisoft and produce then this integrated uh, rendition. Uh, here's one example of, of the East Room that um, shows a little more in more separation between the individual photos. But you can get an idea of, of how well you need to really cover the area with, with your photography. But not only for final photos do we do this, we also do this every day for every excavation square. So first thing in the morning, I go around and I take photos around each square, and then we create one of these models for every square every day. So think what that can mean. Here, you can rotate in and you can look at different elements, but for future generations, think about coming back and evaluating our work or asking new questions. So for this particular square on the uh, field J, it was this sloped, field, sort of a step trench going down the southern slope of, of Umeri, to investigate the fortifications, we turned up evidence that indeed there was a packed earth rampart. And you can see there, as we zoom in, on the far edge there, face of that cut, you can see what looks like a finer gray material. And that was, um, that was part of the, of the um, fortification uh, rampart. So photogrammetry, um, and we hope to be able to stack these sorts of things later so you could really digitally re-excavate a square day by day and look at it from any angle. One more thing that can be very helpful are drones. Drones in the Middle East have kind of a bad rap, bad associations, you know, with people getting um, suddenly blown up and... Um, uh, therefore, we have new restrictions on drones. We can't use drones without in Jordan without the uh, military being present, and there's certainly new costs involved. But um, for a little while, we did have basically uh, freedom to use our own drones. So here is an example of the drone we took over. It was a, an octocopter. It had eight blades. It had more lifting power. We could put um, two cameras on and do 3D uh, imagery as well. A more single camera uh, still photography. And from that, we imaged uh, the entire site of Tel El Umeri, uh, which is increasingly important as we can no longer excavate there and we are worried about the, the future of the site. Uh, nevertheless, we can do, um, we can zoom in a little bit from that drone imagery. Uh, it's, it's all the other that I showed you was from the ground, but air based gives you a whole new perspective on the site and you can zoom around uh, looking at our three decades of excavation there, um, four decades, the different fields down to the south end, the dolmen there caught in the bottom left corner, swinging around, looking from the west and then back around. So it gives a great overall uh, documentary um, record of the site. Or for example, here at the, the north end, this is the late Bronze Age palace structure with the early Iron Age community um, built up against what was then the ruins of that very northwest corner. Um, but we can look down and, and um, move around from different viewpoints, looking into the sanctuary the, um, where the altar and the niche was, moving over to the four-room house, get a good idea of its context and setting and other buildings of that community uh, further to the south. Um, in one last view, Certainly drones can provide uh, interesting aerial perspective of what it's like to be on an archeological dig. Many people watch the History Channel or some other documentary and um, you know, are fascinated by the whole process of unearthing the past. It is a lot of work, it's strenuous, so not everybody will get that opportunity. Nevertheless, um, different photographic techniques, different immersive sorts of recording techniques can bring people closer to that experience. So here I am flying down over that uh, step trench and past, this is field D from years and years ago, the early Bronze Age um, area that we showed you earlier today. Quick wave from myself and then a walk by, um, which is image stabilized. So it's a little bit better except for the internet transmission here. 
Um, but looking down into the excavation pits, you can see all of the sorts of activities that are typical of an excavation, uh, filling the baskets with dirt, uh, carefully scraping with trowel and and sweeping up into the dustpans, lifting them out, out of increasingly deep probes and up the ladders, we begin to get so chains of, of ladders um, working up and out of the, the depths here. Digging for answers, sweeping, cleaning for photographs, and uh, Vera Kopecki has been so helpful with documenting in our, uh, by photography of our artifacts. And that brings us back around kind of to the beginning. Why do we integrate technology with archaeology? Well, for documenting the past, that's really the most valuable, important aspect that, that we can do. We dig it up, we need to document it, make it available, present it to the present. Like I said before, not everybody can sit down with a large excavation uh, publication, but to make this increasing amount of data intelligible really to people to understand ah so that's what it's about that's what it's telling us and finally preserving it for the future i wish we could go back 100 years and tell McAllister and say the rockefeller excavation megiddo please record more so we can answer some of our questions today uh, we know that in the future there'll be future questions that um, we can only hope to provide the data so that they can they can answer those questions Elaborate a little more on research technologies that are used in house, such as XRF, RTI, carbon 14 dating, things like that. Uh, certainly, one of our big goals at Valua is to create a, a sequence uh, with carbon 14 of what we call it wiggle match dating, because if you get a occupation sequence of, of layers, you know that the lower one is before the next one up and so forth, and you can actually improve on the accuracy of, of the C14. And from that, we can create a, a regional um, sequence of pottery styles. Right now, for the Moabite sequence, there's, there are still quite a few unknowns about exactly um, you know, where to place it on the fine scale of history, right? We know more about the Ammonites uh, over in Israel, the Israelites, Phoenician pottery, so forth. We want to do that for Moab. So carbon-14 is, is very important. Um, other small artifacts can be um, imaged with um, reflectance transformation imaging or RTI. Why? Because the artifacts go back to Jordan or stay in Jordan. We may have a short-term loan. Um, but these sorts of imaging techniques allow us to examine features of them that you can't just see from a flat photograph. So that's why we do that in the lab. That's why it's so important. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Bramlett, for telling us all about these technological advances that are helping move archaeology from the past into the future.